the visit of the Magi, Matthew 2, 1 through 12. Eh, whatever's on your paper. Yeah, I know. This is a... That's the only problem we <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Um, I I don't know. I've got I've I've had so many calls over the holidays with people, but have I told you we prayed for my my aunt Nancy uh, that's in Florida. She fell and broke both hips and um, has a UTI and pneumonia in her lungs. And um, I called our family. We all got into prayer over the thing. And the, they, they called in a specialist. She's 84. They called in a specialist uh, the next morning. They said they wanted to do surgery right away. And, and uh, they said, well, you know, we'd like to take a, are we confident and all that? And they said, well, in the morning we'll do surgery. They brought in a, the family brought in a specialist. And he went, hmm, I don't think that's it. I don't think that's, and so they, they went and did uh, MRIs and things like that, really took a look at all this. And she didn't have, they, originally they were going to do surgery on two broken hips and neither one were broke. Whoa. Is that not a miracle? <laughs> and um, but she still has pneumonia in her lungs and still has a UTI. But um, that explains a lot of the reasons why she fell. And um, but she's in pretty good shape. But I'm telling you, boy, what a ministry flew through my family. You know, everybody was well, you know stupid doctors and everything. Now it's an answer to prayer. <laughs> That's God's as an answer to prayer. You can look at it any way you want to look at it. People look at it a whole lot of different ways. But I got a call that she was, you know, at 84 and you broke both hips and got pneumonia. And so I tried to prepare the people and and, and uh, I said, look, let's just sleep on it. Let's just pray for for complete healing. Let's, let's just sleep on it and let, the deci let them decide in the morning what they're going to do. Then we'll shift gears. And... Uh, Oh, man, I mean, and so, you know, everybody wants to go, well, the stupid doctors and everything, and I go like, people, people, people. I mean, you and I thought, about the, I thought about the disciples. You know, they always want to show me one more miracle, and I'll believe, no matter how many he showed them. Give, give me one more, just one more miracle, and I'll believe that you're the real deal. That's kind of the way we all live in it. Um, one miracle to another, and no matter how many he gets us, if we don't want to believe, we just do not do it. So you might thank the Lord for that and pray for her continual healing. And then <clears throat> today, like many of you might know, <clears throat> um, hospice is once again called in on um, Linda Simrel. And uh, they think it's just a matter of a few days, but... Listen, I can't tell you how many calls this Christmas I've had about this. More than one. And uh, I just got, where I just go like, forget it. Let's just, <laughs> I mean, I'm just into miracles. I'm just like into miracles of this Christmas. So I, I just, I, I just about believe everything, so. <clears throat> but um, be much in prayer for that family. That's the main thing. Uh, going out to visit them tomorrow on. Put my eyeballs on it. But I've had like three occasions already this Christmas where I've seen absolute miracles. I mean, just absolute. I mean, just. I mean, there's just one of those things that everybody goes like, well, I don't know how we can explain this. Uh, I say, I can. If anybody's interested. Well, anyhow, here we are in Matthew, the second chapter, and we're looking at the first 12 verses, then we'll have prayer. <clears throat> it, and it begins with a very interesting statement, because we're in Matthew 2, and they call this the birth story, and it's not. And it's okay. <clears throat> it's okay, but... Um, well, here we are in Matthew, the second chapter, and, it, and it, it begins with a very important phrase. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, <clears throat> this is... Jesus is over a year older 
this is the second Christmas story. If you want to read the first one, you go to Luke. If you want to read the second one, well, you can actually go to Matthew 1 for the first story. But Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, and they were saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Pay attention to the word worship in this passage. <clears throat> and Herod the king, when he heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem. And all Jerusalem with him. Boy, I mean, if you ever lived with somebody, if he gets upset, the whole family gets upset. Well, this is this guy. And gathered together all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he began to inquire of them where the, where the Christ was to be born. They said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for it has been written by the prophet, and he, and he quotes Malachi, I mean uh, Micah 5.2, And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are no means least among the leaders of Judah, for it is out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And one of the names that God attached to Jesus, like we've seen Emmanuel, we've seen Jesus, Christ, of course, is his prophetic name out of the Old Covenant. And now, ruler, shepherd. And, and I'm going to tell you, if you want an interesting study, pay attention to the different ways he's now going to be described before he dies as a shepherd. Because in itself is a wonderful study. This shepherd idea is really going to define who he's going to be in his first advent. The word ruling shepherd, that's one of about six titles that he carries with the idea of shepherd. Then uh, Herod secretly called the Magi and ascertained from them the time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and make careful search for the child. And when you have found him, report to me that I too may come and worship him. Now, in verse 7. He's going to ask them, and he's going to become an interrogator to, to ascertain from him the exact time they saw the star because that would tell him, and they gave it to him because before chapter 2 is closed, he's going to go into Jerusalem, and he's going to kill every child in, in Bethlehem. I said Jerusalem, but I mean Bethlehem. He's going to go into Bethlehem and kill every child under the age, uh, boys under the age of two, boys under the age of two. And how, how does he know that? He's, at, he's ascertained the exact date when they saw the star and the birth of the king of the Jews. Well, and uh, so they've gone to Beth, verse 9, and having heard the king, they went their way, and lo, the star that they saw in the east is now in the west. Lo, the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over where the Christ child was. Now, listen, we know he was born in what? A manger in a barn or a stall or cave or whatever, right? Uh, actually, uh, most theologians believe that he was born in a birthing stall of the sheep. And these were not normal shepherds nor normal sheep, right? We know they were temple shepherds, and these were sacrificial lambs. Behold the Lamb of God. Uh, but anyhow, until it came and stood over where they so the star, after they leave Jerusalem, the star picks them back up. The star, the key, the star was, the, was the key to get them to Jerusalem. Now they're in Jerusalem. They say Bethlehem. The star is going to pick them up at Jerusalem and take them to Bethlehem and to the exact what? House, not manger. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And they came into the house, and they saw the child with Mary, his mother. Now, I want you to pay careful attention to this. In, care, careful what you say. see. They came into the house, and they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down, and they worshipped him. They didn't worship Mary. They weren't really looking for Mary. They were looking for the child. Right? Just remember that. I mean, he is what worship is about. 
And they worshiped him, and opened their, their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned by God, look at this now, and having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed for their own country by another way. And, of course, that upsets Herod. Okay? So let's have a word of prayer. And we'll do our study tonight. I'm talking about Gentile missionaries to Israel. These magi became Gentile missionaries to Israel. Okay? Which is kind of a unique idea in itself. Let us pray. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit. He is the great teacher of the human soul. If you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, then the Holy Spirit lives inside your body. Third member of the Godhead, God the Holy Spirit, lives inside your body and will live there until the day you die. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And he's there to minister the word of God and the work of God through your life as well as in your life. To be sure that he is able to be that agent of divine will work. You got to be sure there's no unconfessed sin in your life. It could be mental <laughs> attitude sins, sins of the tongue and overt sins. You, you name them or cite them or state them to God in your own heart in silence. And 1 John 1, 9 says, he, he, God is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And you can do this at any age when you understand that. And for, so, Father, we thank you tonight for these who have come our way to study with us by automobile and by Internet. And I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth for the word of God tonight in the story of the Gentile missionaries to Israel. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> what I found interesting, just because we've become engaged as a church in a lot of foreign mission work, uh, we've always been engaged in foreign, but we, now, I mean, we've, We've got people out there on the front line on foreign mission work. Uh, this, this became interesting to me with the concept of the Magi as Gentile missionaries coming to Israel. And so I want to talk about four things about that to you tonight. tonight. Um, uh, this will probably be a two-part series. We'll talk more about the Magi and, and, and that uh, next week. But, but I want to show you some things textually. So point number one, as we read our lesson text, pay special attention to the travel of the Gentile missionaries from the east by the following four arrivals. There's four arrivals, arriving, you know, ar arrival in this passage that I thought was important. And so I broke this down. I broke it down actually into, into four sections of arrivals. When, when I read uh, Matthew 2, 1 through 8, we found that they were in the east, probably in, in the, the Mesopotamian area. And this is a, this is a, a huge travel. The, this, this is several months. I mean, this is not like get on an airplane and fly there like Rick did. And, and you're there in uh, how many hours? Three hours. I mean, that's 30. I mean, that's pretty amazing. When you t think of the distance, uh, and uh, how much of that was layover out of that 30? Yeah, and about 12 of it's layover. I mean, nearly half is layover. So this is, but this is probably a four or five month journey for this, and it was a large group. You know, they, they talk about the three wise men, but this is a large group that came in there. Um, and so, I mean, Ezra, Ezra talks about this journey and puts it in, that, that's why people believe it's four or five months because of Ezra. But they arrive, and, they, and the whole thing started by seeing a special star in the east. And, when they saw, and these are astronomers. And so when they, uh, when they saw it, this special star, uh, and, and th that was a religion. I'm going to talk more about this uh, later, but... This was a religious thing and had been influenced to be able, by Daniel. Daniel was part of this group. In uh, Daniel 1, for example, he was declared ten times 
wiser than all of the astronomers and all of the people involved in divination in the nation, which was a religion. A an old one, too. Um, ten times wiser. And his influence, like, J like Joseph's influence in Egypt, they, they were part of this cult, too, a a part of that religion, and had an enormous influence because of God. I love the way Daniel... Every time they called Daniel in because they couldn't figure it out, you know the first thing he told them? Every time, you, every time, you know, I don't care how many times he appeared before the king, go, I don't know what's going on, my people, they don't know squat, what we're going to do. He would say, listen, I may be able to help you only if God will help me to help you. He made that clear every time. He made it clear. This comes from a, doesn't come from your God system. This comes from another God system. And my God, if he wants to tell you what this is about, then I will listen to you and I will tell you what he told me to tell you. But you've got to understand that. Isn't that something? And they, they found out by keeping records that he was 10 times smarter because he paid attention to God than they did when they didn't pay attention to God. I mean, 10 times smarter than the smartest is pretty smart. 10 times wiser than the smartest. <laughs> so, but, uh, and, and the Babylonian people were not, you know, the Mesopotamian people weren't, weren't dummies. Uh, unless they didn't believe, uh, then none of us are smart. But anyhow, so they see the star, and based on their f forecasting of it, and based on the influence of the prophecy that Daniel was able to tell them of the star of the star of Jacob, which comes from Numbers 24, 17. And so they had this background. When they saw that special star, they went, wow, the king of the Jews has been born. And so they packed up and headed out. Why do they care? Now listen to me. Why do they care? that a king of Jerusalem has been born. Why would they care? Because they understood that this was going to be the savior of the world, that this was going to be the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Where did they ever get that idea? They got it from people like Daniel who enormously influenced them in the word of God. And that's how. Well, they, they, they arrive in Jerusalem in the first eight verses. They talk to Herod because that, that's the capital. So they go talk to the top guy uh, to see if they where. Certainly they must know. He said, well, wait a minute. Let me ask my guys. Because he doesn't know. He's got the Bible, but he doesn't read it. If he'd have read the Bible, he could have known something was up. He didn't know it's up. The people that didn't read the Bible, but somebody else read it to them, they got it. That's interesting. So they run out. They come back with information, and they say, well, he, listen, Christ is supposed to be born in Bethlehem. So he comes back and says, Christ is supposed to be born in Bethlehem. L before you leave, though, let me get the exact date because I need this in my records. So he gets the exact date and timing of it, and... So he says, uh, go find Bethlehem. You take, you take a right and just go to the end of it, uh, the road. Anyhow, as soon as they leave, the star appears in the west this time, right? They've gone from the east to the west. Last time they saw the star, it was in the east. This time they look at the star, it's in the west. That's an unusual star. That's an unusual star. UFO, that's probably, <laughs> that'd have been it, wouldn't it? I was an unusual star. And not only did it pick them up, but listen, that star took them right to the house. Took them right to the house. And so when we read verses 8 through 10, it's all about the king star. It was called the king star. I saw the king star and I've come to... The king's been born. In verse 11, we're, we're arrival. We've gone for, we've arrived in Jerusalem. Now we've arrived in Bethlehem. When we arrive in Bethlehem, we don't know what house. 
right? So at, at our Christmas, we, we that's all right. Listen, that, that's my man. Well, we always made, we made sure Santa didn't pass our house. You know what I mean? So we always had a way to make sure and nobody go to bed unless that, that certain light was there. Well, that, see, and so they have that star. They arrive at the house of the Christ child, and, and look what they're going to do. They're going to worship. Now, I want you to pay attention to this word worship for a minute. You're going to find this word, listen, it dominates a passage. When a word dominates a passage, you pay attention to it. The word worship is dominated in this. We have not heard this word. We're going to hear that, listen, and I'll tell you, this is the first time you're going to hear this word in the book of Matthew. And listen, the second time you're going to hear this word used in context is in Matthew 4. Matthew 4 dealing with the, the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness where the devil wants him to what? Worship him. You can find that word again. It's just a real interesting word. It's made up of two Greek words. It's the word pros, meaning face to face, and uh, kuneo. Kuneo comes from the word dog, if you look the root up. Um, and uh, that's probably not a, a good idea, but it, it's a dog licking your hand, a master's hand, or, or licking your face, you know. If he doesn't know, he bites you, and if he does know, he licks you, right? He wags his tail, uh, and if he's going to eat you, the tail goes straight out, uh, uh, doesn't waggle, right? And we're not going to mess with that dog. He sticks his, then we're not doing that. So, but here's the word worship. It's found in verse 2. We've come to worship. It's used in verse 4. King says, oh, um, in other words, two, then it worship in four, and then the king gets involved in it. Then they get to the house, it's wor they come, they've come to worship. Look, it's in verse 2, it's in verse 4, it's in verse 6, it's in verse 8, it's in verse 11. And uh, they've come to worship the ruling shepherd, the, the king of Israel. Okay? Listen, the context of this word worship is, <laughs> how do you know? Sometimes this word worship is used in a lot of funny contexts. Like Satan says, I want you to worship me. And so this word is really important. The pros cuneo means, means it's the word, cuneo is the word to kiss. And pros is face to face, and it means to be able to kiss somebody face to face. What, let me tell you what that represents. It re represents a relationship, right? Right, it's a relationship. It's a, it's a relationship. At least I got one person paying attention. Let me show you the background to this word worship. Let me show you the background. Now, the background is God himself. But the background to this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay out a path. This is, not in your path. this is not in your scripture, so I want you to write this down if you're interested in this word worship. Uh, I want you to write down Exodus, the 12th chapter, verses 21 through 28. Uh, this is, that's the passage on Passover. And verse 27 is going to be a key verse for you. Another, another verse that I think would be important to you on this subject matter would be Hebrews 1, 5, and 6. Hebrews 1, 5, and 6. Oh. Uber, Uber, Uber showed up. Grandma, are they going to have enough? They got enough to go home with? Nobody should ever leave this church hungry. Um, Hebrews 1, 5, and 6 tells us if you're going to worship God, here's what, this, here's what these verses are going to tell you. If you're going to worship God, you have to, you have to go through Christ. If you're going to worship God, if you're, if you're going to worship God in spirit and truth, like in John 4, here's another passage, John 4, 23, 24, if you're going to worship God, you got to worship. If you're going to worship God, you got to worship in spirit and truth. And you, you got to worship, and he, he said, you know who said that? Christ. I'm the way, the truth, and life, no man. 
comes to the Father. No man's going to work. You can't worship God apart from Christ and, and have true worship of spirit and truth. You understand? You could, you could do that, but it's not going to be real. Okay? So that, th those are important. Um, John 4, 23, 24, Hebrews 1, 5, and 6. Exodus, the 12th chapter, is a really important passage, in my opinion, for this. But he, when he arrives at the house, he comes to Jerusalem for one reason. They come to Jerusalem for one reason, to worship the king of the Jews. They go to Bethlehem with one, with one purpose, to worship the king of the Jews, the Messiah. They go to the house. They go for one reason, to worship Christ. What is it that attracts you in your worship if it's not Christ it's for naught what attracts you about worship is it is it music not if it's not about Christ is it emotional not if it's about Christ it's got to be about Christ right got to be about Christ I mean you know the the reason for the season the reason for the season now, here's the second thing. And, and another point is in verse 12, when they leave. Another important point is they're leaving because they arrived to, to the knowledge of don't go home the way you came. And so when they leave, they go a different route. They're not going to go back. and the, they, uh, the, God appears to them and tells them, don't go back to Herod and don't go back the way you came. It's too dangerous. You go back a different, and, 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 and verse 12 is very important because you see their connection with God. This whole trip was about God. Was it the star that led them? Not really. It was the God of the star, right? We know that in verse 12. We didn't know that until we got to verse 12. But in verse 12, we know that what really led them all the way to Jerusalem, to Bethlehem, to the house, to the Christ child, it was God. And God has brought him in, and God is going to take him out. Agreed? See? We know who brought him in. The same one that took him out. He said, we're going to go home a different route. Route, route. Here's the second point. One focus of the lesson, another focus of the lesson, is on the word saw. S-A-W. Saw. It is the Greek word horeo. Horeo. It is found in our lesson text in the first section. Verses 1 through 2, I mean, verses 1 through 8, in that section, it's found in verse 2. They saw his star. In the second section, 9 through 10, they saw his star again. The first time they saw it in the east, the second time they saw it in the west. And then in verse 11, they saw why they came to Jerusalem and Bethlehem and to the house. They saw the Christ child. Horeo is a really interesting word, and I'm going to talk more about that in point three. The great discovery of what the Gentile missionary saw was much more than the king star. They actually found the star of the star. Because the star of the star wasn't the star, it was the Christ. It was Christ. He is the star. He should always be the star of your life. Whatever else you think you, is worth following is not. <clears throat> it is not. What they received from the king star was divine guidance. Agreed? Divine guidance. In their pursuit of divine truth regarding Christ, they sought divine guidance. Like the woman at the well and the city of Sychar. Well worth your reading, John 4. And why were they, why did they make such a trip? Why did they bring their gifts and why did they want to worship? Listen, seeking the fulfillment of the prophecy behind the king star. Right? They wanted, I mean, why is it you sit in Bible class? Sessions in and sessions out. You know why? Because you want to see the reality of God work in your life. Just like the other day with my Aunt Nancy. Man, my family, we hit our knees. We went, oh, God. You are the creator of the human body. You are the creator of all things. You put the breath of life in us. Dear God, you're the deal. 
and we're looking for you to step into this. We're asking you to step into this family situation and do your deal. Do your thing, God, and may we not miss it. But I still got people in my family who do not need to miss stuff. And I'm okay if he doesn't or doesn't because I know God is real and I know if he doesn't, then he's got something else bigger and I want to see that too. Whatever's going on, I want to see it. Why, what, are, what are you looking for? You're looking for, the, you're looking for the dynamics of the fulfillment of the word of God. Is God true to his word? Will he do? Will he show up and will he do what he promised me? I wouldn't follow God a week if he wouldn't do that in my life. I was the most distrusting person in the whole wide world. And the last thing I wanted to do is get connected to some phony baloney religion. I had enough problems with my life without adding that. If Christ hadn't been the real deal, I wouldn't be here after these many years. I wasn't looking for religion. I wasn't looking for anything. God found me. But I'm going to tell you, if God wasn't dead, if this was just a simple old book like, now I lay me down to sleep, Humpty Dumpty, I wouldn't follow that. If he wasn't true to his word, I wouldn't be either. But you know what I've discovered? What I've discovered since 1963, God is faithful when we are, even when we are faithless, he is faithful. You can take that for what it's worth. But I'm telling you, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. I'm going to log all these hours into this stuff and put my, my life on the line on all that and believe it and tell my people and my friends and neighbors this stuff. If it ain't true. This is a real deal. I'm telling you, this is a real deal. I stepped out of atheism into Christianity. This is the real deal. All this, I'll tell you, phony baloney is the world. Phony baloney is the world. That's phony baloney. This stuff is real. But listen, you know, it's not because you have a Bible makes it real. It's what's in the Bible in your soul is what makes it real. I don't know how people get by. When I got that news the other day, the first thing I did was have prayer on the phone. And then when I hung up, I called all my family. I circled the wagons. I called my family, all the, all the kids in my family. I said, look, here it is. Pray this thing out. <laughs> oh, what's happened to us as a people? We used to pray things through. We used to pray them through. We prayed it. We hung on to God until there was nothing else left. Until that's, he was enough. I mean, now we live in an instant. If he's not there right there, yeah, we let go. And God's a real deal, people. There is always, there is always, listen to me, in the directive will of God, there's always three things that have to line up in divine guidance. You want divine guidance out of the directive will of God? Faith comes by hearing. You want faith to work in your life? Three things. You always look for three things to line up in your life. The geographical will, there's a right place. The mental will, there's a right way to view it. And the operational will is the right timing in the directive will of God. The geographical will, listen, here is it, here it is. The word where. Now I want to show it to you. Look at verse two. You still got your Bibles there. Look, look, look at the word where, because where is the geographical will. I say to Rick, where did you go on your mission trip? Now I have tr a little trouble with that because I've had him all over the map. All right. Uh, and I thought I really had it until I had prayer with him on Sunday. He walked out and he said, nah, you missed it again. I said, oh, my goodness. I'm, I don't know where I'm praying in Africa. But look look the word. It's, it's pos. It's P-O-U, pos. And it's the word where in the Greek. Verse, verse 2, where is he who has been born of the Jew? This is it. Where are they? They've, they, they, they have left home. They've gone on a journey four months deep. And it's about where. It's about where. And then, and then it gets, notice on your paper, 
It's in verse 4. Herod wants to know where the Christ was born. And then look in verse 9. They go to Bethlehem. They want to know where the Christ child was. You see? See the word where? You know what it is? That's the directive will of God being worked out in your life, isn't it? Where? Where do you live? Where are you going? What are you doing? You know, these are the questions. Listen, where? Geographical will of God. Are you where you ought to be? I, I mean, are you in the right church? I don't know. Are you learning anything? Does a guy open the word of God and take you deep into it? Is that important to you? Well, it should be if faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. And how much should I learn? As much as God wants you to grasp. I give you, listen, it's like eating. We always give you more. We, you know, you, you should be able to walk out of here with a doggy bag. It's because different levels of, different levels of maturity in this room. Some, some don't have as much as others. But listen, everybody should walk out of here fed. You should get something from it. And, but anyhow, the word where, and, it, you, and you can see it in this passage, the geographical will, the right place, the right place. When I got ready to, to become a pastor of a church, I mean, I, I, I did all kinds of interviews all over the United States because working with Mr. Graham. How did you settle down in Birmingham with thousands upon thousands of churches? The last thing, by numbers, that when I looked at the, the, the number of churches in the Jefferson County, the last place in the whole wide world I thought God would ever send me would be Birmingham. I went, dear father, there are more, there's a church. There, there's not just one church on every corner. There's two or three. <laughs> I mean, you can't go anywhere without. Is, look how many in this, in what we call our church field. I don't remember anymore. There was like 15 churches in what I call my church field. There's 15 churches. Look how many churches you passed just to get here. You walk, you walk back home tonight somewhere. If you walk uh, two blocks, you're going to pass two or three churches. But I, mean, I really struggle with that. I've been to places where they didn't have a church on every corner. I said, that's probably the place I need to be. And here I am, and I've been here for 40-some years. The mental will of God. The mental will is really God. What are they searching for? See, what is it? I mean, they, you know, it takes a lot of mental attitude construction in your mind to, hit, to, to stick, to go four months in deep into something, go into a town, uh, 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 <laughs> an Israelite capital. You understand? Well, if you understand a bunch of, if you understand sending a, a delegation from I, Iraq to Israel, now maybe you got an understanding of where these guys are, where these, what these guys are going into. They're going to walk through a minefield. And what do you think Israel is going to feel about this group? The Babylonian group. What do you, how do you think they're going to feel about them after they sacked them? Drug them off. I don't know what you think about this Magi visit, but this, you talk about intense and electricity in the air. Hmm. And so the right, the right viewpoint, what are they searching for? They're going through all of this because they, they want to worship the king of the Jews who is going to be the king of the kings and lord of lords. The operational will of God is the right timing. The right timing. What was the right timing? They saw the star and they knew. They knew the prophecy connected to it of Jacob's star of Numbers 24. And now they want fulfillment. They want to see the fulfillment of that prophecy. And so they come and worship and bring gifts. <laughs> The word saw. See the word in verse 3? Here's what people miss about their own life. And here's verse 3. And this is important because the word saw, 
they came to see, they saw. They came to see and they saw, all right? See, that's past tense. They came to see and they saw. They came to see and they saw. Right? Now what? Every member of the human race is born with two sets of eyes. Don't miss this. Do not miss this. There's the physical or the natural sight to the body. The Greeks had a word for it, blippo. 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 Like Psalms 94.9 says, God who formed the ear, do you think he can't hear? Or God who formed the eye, do you think he can't see? So we learn a couple of lessons from that, don't we? All right? In other words, there's a physical eye and there's a spiritual eye. Because, see, God can see. And God is a spirit. And those who worship him must worship his spirit and truth. God who formed the eye, is there not another sight that he's interested in you finding? Yes, God. Because when you find God, you find spiritual sight. And so there's, there's the idea of Psalms 94.9. And then the, there, there's a physical sight and there's a spiritual sight. The spiritual sight to the soul. For example, Paul, uh, Paul picked this idea of Psalms 94 up in 1 Corinthians 2. So let's go there. 1 Corinthians, it's a very famous passage. Uh, but I want to show it to you in context of where we are. 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 2. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10. You'll know it when you get there. Um, just as it is written, if you have a study Bible, you're going to see that he's, he's, he's opened up the prophecy to you. Just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which has not entered the heart of man. Now watch. When you describe the ear, the eye, and the heart, that's perception. That's perception. That's perception. Which has not entered the heart, that's comprehension. See, there's a mind and there's a heart in mentality. There's a perception and comprehension. You can have perception and not comprehension, but if it's in your heart, it's comprehension. What you've perceived has now become a truth. What you, what you were told is true is now believed to be true in your life. You understand that? Well, that, that which the eye has not seen, the ear has not heard, and has not entered the heart, all that God has prepared for, man, for those who love him, for to us... God revealed them through the Holy Spirit. I mean, the Holy Spirit is able to bring eyesight into faith so that we're able to walk by faith and not by sight. The Holy Spirit does that. He takes the Word of God and gives you spiritual sight for it, right? So this is important for to us. God revealed them through the Holy Spirit for the Spirit searches all things Watch this now. The depth of God. Do you understand that? The deep things of God. That's why spiritual growth maturity is so important because you grow in the word of God. The word of God grows in you and faith grows out of you. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God in Romans 10, 17. And it starts at a little root, and a little tree comes up. Then the, as the tree grows and develops, it branches into all kinds of stuff, and the tree gets big, and the branches get a lot, and the birds hide in them, and yeah, 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 yeah. That's called spiritual maturity of the Word of God in your life, working out of you. So it's important. Two sources. Listen, there's two sources of soul sight. There's two sources of soul sight. 
There's divine viewpoint that comes from the Bible. And there's cosmos diabolicus that comes from the devil. False teachings. False ideas. False beliefs. I mean, the devil has a system too. He told Jesus that in Matthew 4. He told him, you believe me, I'm going to give you the highway. Broadway, playing Monopoly. That whole street's yours. I'll give, I'll give you Broadway. Give you that whole, that whole street. Even the jail that goes with it. Divine viewpoint, that's the faith system, and cosmos diabolicus, that's the sight system. And so Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, as we all know, for we walk by faith, that's divine viewpoint, that is the works of divine, of uh, the directive will, not by sight, works against it, that works against it. The very things that God wants you, I want you to be in the right place, thinking the right thing, doing the right thing. The devil works against you on all those things. He opposes that all the way. Why? Because, listen, he don't mind you going to Bible study if you never learn anything. Because, you see, Bible study is where faith is takes root, is planted in your soul. And then it begins to grow in your soul and you begin to operate from that. You begin to walk by faith and not by sight. Because when you walked in here, you walked in here walking by sight. When you walk out of here, you ought to be walking by faith. And by faith is where the dynamics of God works. If you want to see the reality of God, you go like, well, I've heard about God all my life, but I've never seen the reality of him. Well, I'll tell you the reality, and you sitting here tonight. Who would have ever believed that Robert would be sitting in Bible study under my teaching? You talk about a Christmas miracle? It's Robert. Robert has put more faith back in my soul than you could possibly imagine. Robert. Robert has been one of the great Christmas gifts to me from last year to this year. Has been an absolute gift to me as a pastor. That's the real deal. That's how I know God lives. That's how I know God is real. It amazes me to watch Robert come in and sit down because he knows he's in the right place with the right people. And his desire and hope in life is to be able to have some of this rub off on him and get his life back into some kind of order. And it's going to happen. Robert, that is for sure, buddy. That is for sure. But he's been my gift from last Christmas to this Christmas. Robert's been my gift from God. It's been an absolute point of encouragement to my life. Here's a great verse for you. Ephesians 1, 18 and 19. Listen to what it says. And it, here's your spiritual sight. I pray that the eyes of your heart. See, you have eyes in your heart, but they need to be opened. So you have two sets, of, you're born with two sets of eyes. Two sets of eyes. And this is important. I pray that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened. That's divine viewpoint thinking. Might be enlightened to see, to see that God has a light shining on you. And the world doesn't. Oh, the world will shine it on you until they, that they have you in the palm of their hand and then they take the light off of you. And make, make, make you a slug. Then they, they tell you what a loser you are. Before then, oh, you're the hottest thing in town. Oh, man, you're this and you're that. And as soon as, it gets, as soon as the devil gets you in the palm of his hand, he tells you you're the worst loser. You're not worth, you're not worth spit. Now tell me you don't know that. If you don't, then go downtown and work a little bit. I pray that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened. Watch this. So that, so that you may know. Watch the three what's. 
Here's what God promises you. I will enlighten your soul. I will enlighten it. If you'll pay attention to me, I will enlighten the eyes of your heart so that you may know these three things. And here they are. Listen, what he'll teach you. What is the hope of his calling? You know, see, this is interesting. I'm working with a guy who is 84. 80, let's see. 80, yeah, I guess, in Michigan right now. I'm tutoring him. I'm mentoring him. Lutheran. In a senior citizen home. Says. What's his name? Bob. 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 Bob Kirk. Bob Kirk. He says. Why am I here? I mean, I'm stuck here in a nursing home. <laughs> Just throw it onto the floor, it'll be it'll be off. Uh, he says. He says. Why am I here? I, I hate this. I said, well, I'm going to give you a passage. So I read him this verse. I, pr I pray. I say, here's my prayer for you, that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling. See, he thought he, I said to him, <laughs> I said to him, can you find a pulse on you? He said, a what? I said, can you find a pulse on you? A pulse? Uh, yeah, is your heart beating? He went, oh. It's interesting how as you get older, you both holler on the phone. <laughs> when he, when he, he goes like, What? Right. Well, anyhow. Yeah, he said I got a heartbeat. Of course I. <laughs> of course I have. Well, I just wanted to be sure. And I said, listen, this is for you. I'm going to pray that your heart be enlightened, right? That was his prayer. I'm going to pray that your heart be enlightened so that you may know. And I said, I'm just going to give you one today. I'll call you next week for the second one. I'm going to give you one. What is the, I'm going to give you the first one. What's that passage? <laughs> it's all right. I'll text it. What is the hope of his calling? See, that's what he asked me, wasn't it? I don't have any hope, Ron. I have no hope in my life anymore. I meet a lot of people that way. I meet him young and old. They don't have to be old to feel that way, do they? I met a lot of young people that way. And so we, t we sat and talked a little bit about it, about what would be the hope of his calling. I said, what do you hope would be your calling? So we talked about that. Then I said, well, wait a minute. Okay, what do you think God's hope of his calling you would be? What would be God's hope for you? He said, well, I don't know. I said, well, you'll have to think about it this week. But I'm thinking, I don't know because I don't know your place, but I'm thinking that probably most of the people in there have got a foot in the grave and one out of banana peeling. What do you think? <laughs> right? I mean, if there's ever one group of people, I believe that would be that group. Anyway, well, I hadn't thought about that. Well, I said, what foot have you got? What foot is where on your life, in your life? So we got in a conversation on that. So next week, I'm going to call up, and I'm going to give him the second what. 
See, I'm giving all three of them to you tonight. What is the hope of his calling? I'm telling you that's important to your life tonight. What is the hope of his calling? What is the hope of his calling? What do you think his hope is of calling? You know, you do have a calling on your life. There's nobody in this room that doesn't have this. The problem is you haven't been enlightened. Your eyes haven't been opened to understand that. Do you know how you know that? Are you breathing? Have you got a pulse? If you're breathing, it's because God has permitted it because you have Nisha Mahayim in you. You have the breath of life in you. As long as you have it and your feet are on earth, they're not under the earth, but on the earth, God has a calling. There is a hope of his calling for your life. The second what? Notice the second what? This is, he's going to get real excited with this next week when I call him. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? What, won't that be an interesting conversation? What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And the third what? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe? It has nothing to do with your circumstances in life. It has everything to do with your eyes of understanding. Having your eyes open to be enlightened to what God has you. Have you got breath? Have you got a pulse? Then God has a purpose. He has a calling. He has the riches of inheritance upon you. He is the surpassing. He wants to show you the surpassing greatness of his power in your life. When I get there, I'm going to tell them, you know what? Bob, you can shut the lights off and people can walk in your room and say, whoa, it's, it is so bright in here. You, you might have to get a pair of sunglasses and keep them by the door and tell them, hey, put on your glasses because you just walked into a light full of, a room full of light. Aren't you glad that I don't call you and talk to you? Mm -mm. Well, point four, and I'm going to hurry through this because we got, we got to quit. Grace salvation is designed, listen to me, grace salvation is designed to, to spiritually open blind eyes of the soul. Isaiah 42, 6 and 7, watch this carefully. I underline key words. I will appoint you as a covenant to the, look, I will appoint you as a covenant to the people. As a light to the nations to open their blind eyes. This is picked up in Acts 26, 18. Talking about salvation. Salvation is about opening the eyes so that they may turn from darkness, the cosmic system, to light, the divine system. And from the domain of Satan to God. That they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance, there's our idea, and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in Christ. Isn't that powerful? When you read the story of the blind man, you get to see two miracles. He was born blind, physically and spiritually. He meets Jesus. Jesus opens his physical eyes. They meet again the second time, and he gets saved, and he opens his spiritual eyes. Isn't that interesting? Two miracles in Christ. One, blind from birth. We all are blind from birth. <laughs> Listen to 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. Even if I, and it's, it's a first-class condition, it's true. Even, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. That's the unbeliever. In whose case the God of this world, Satan, has been blinded in the minds of the unbelieving ones so that they might not see the light, that is the light of the gospel. And this word light here is unique. It's unique in its Greek structure. It means to shine forth the enlightenment of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. The Magi have come to come from the east to worship the king of the Jews as Gentile missionaries to Israel. Okay? Isaiah 49, 6, he says, it is, is, it, is, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribe of, of Jacob and to restore the preserved one, that is the pivot of Israel. I will also make you a light 
of the nations, the Gentiles, so that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. You know, that, you know what that's talking about? That's talking about Christ. And, and you know what the writer, before Jesus leaves, is going to give you Matthew 28. And what you, you know what he tells you to do? Go out of, leave Israel and go to the nation, go to the Gentile nation. You know how this whole thing started? Gentiles came to them. <laughs> well, let's have a word of prayer and we'll release them and then we'll have some personal prayer here before we leave tonight if, you, if you've got the time. Let's pray. For those who have visited us tonight on the internet as well as those in our, our congregational teaching, we pray that you would take, you know, my, I would pray that your eyes might be enlightened. That your eyes might be enlightened. That you might come to know the the hope of his calling. The enormous inheritance in Christ that you have in time and eternity. And that you would come to know the surpassing greatness of his power working in us. This is the miracle of Christmas. Christ, Christ, Christ is the miracle of Christmas. To go through this Christmas and not have your your spiritual eyes aware of the miracle of Christmas. The Magi saw it. They saw it the second Christmas. I've seen it today. I've seen it this Christmas. I don't have to see it to believe. I believe to see it. Because my eyes have been enlightened. And I'm so much better for that. And I pray for that in my life. And I pray for my people here. I pray for those on the internet. I pray that your eyes be enlightened. To the awesomeness of what God has provided in the package of salvation. The moment we believe that he died for our sins. Was buried and raised from the dead the third day. We enter into an enormous relationship with God as our daddy. And we're so thankful for it tonight in Jesus' name. Amen.